Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com. You know, recently I did a talk about how when artists remake something that they did wonderfully the first time, the remake is seldom as good as the first version because they feel the need to do something different from what they did the first time. And that need kind of wrecks the whole, the whole virtue of their initial thoughts. I mean, that happens very frequently and you all know it because you've all heard it. But one of you quipped, I think, um, very, very appropriately, well, what about artists whose remakes are better the second time around or the third time around or whatever it is? And so I have come up here right off the top of my head with a list of 10, 10, count them, 10 recordings or projects which are markedly superior to their artists' first efforts. And uh, we'll see how they how they how they stack up, and I'm sure you'll have some too, which you are you are free to uh, chime in with. But make sure you're right; they have to be demonstrably superior to the first efforts. So, oh, this one, first one's easy: Beethoven symphonies with Claudio Abbado and the Berlin Philharmonic. This is the famous version where first he did him in Vienna, and everyone sort of went, oh. then he did him in Berlin, and everyone said. Oh. And then he did them again in Berlin because he, there were some videos and he, everyone realized that that first Berlin cycle was a snoozeroo. And so he, they quietly retired that one and replaced it with the good one, the juicy good one. And uh, which was done in, in Italy, actually live, and it's just just much better. And we all know that everybody knows that. I mean, that's that's it was it was you know third times the charm for Claudio Abbado and the Berlin Philharmonic and Beethoven. So there you go. It just goes to show one thing with Abbado, which was always true, which was you never knew what you were going to get. I mean, you know, you, there's no there's no rule with him that later things are better or that he improves on things the second time around. It's, I, I, who knows. So who knows with that guy? Anyway, Bruckner, Symphony Number no. 4 with Klemperer, believe it or not. Remember the old Vienna Symphony one on Vox? Ugh! Oh, God, horrible playing and lousy sound. And, you know, and, and Klemperer himself, remember, he was manic and it depended what phase he was in. You know, he could be incredibly fast and, or unbelievably slow or who knows. But he remade the Bruckner Four with the Philharmonia for EMI, and it was one of the great Bruckner Fours, and it still is, and it's hugely, amazingly superior to his first effort. Thank God, the other one was just awful, and it's actually been reissued by Naxos. You can, you can, you can actually find it. I think only as a digital download, thank God, because at least it's not a physical product. Again, some things don't deserve to be reissued, even if famous people did them, because they didn't always do well. Klemper, in fact, as a conductor, only came into his own in the 50s and 60s when he had a great orchestra to work with. Um, that really was a, a fascinating Indian summer of his career. Um, and, and those later recordings are almost uniformly better than anything he did previously. So there's that. Then we've got Mahler. Mahler's a good one for this, actually, because there were a lot of trashy Mahler recordings way back when, and, and, and they got steadily better as people started to understand the idiom and the music or circumstances were better for performance and orchestras improved and all that. Bruno Walter's Mahler 9. Now, remember, his first one was recorded in 1938, like 10 minutes before the Anschluss, and everybody loved it because of the Anschluss. It had nothing to do with the crappy music making by the Vienna Philharmonic. They sucked. I mean, they're just improvising in places. It's dreadful. The sound was appalling. It was live. And Walter was very unhappy with it. He knew it sucked, and he said it sucked, and he wrote that it sucked. And he was very happy to be able to do the remake with the Columbia Symphony, which is enormously better, although not perfect. There are a few baubles in there, too. Um, but, boy, it's a lot better than that 1938 thing, his 1960-whatever stereo recording. What a difference. What a huge difference. It's unbelievable, the difference. Because, you know, the Vienna Philharmonic just couldn't play it, and because of the Anschluss, and because of, you know, People listen to things because they're historical, not because they're musically superior. And the reverence in which that recording has been held over the, the, the centuries, the decades, it's almost a century old, uh, just is completely, 
completely belied by the musical results. Ugh. So yes, the remake could only be an improvement, a massive improvement. Now, Schubert Symphony Number no. 9, The Great, with Giolini. Now, Giolini, you know, he had a very limited repertoire on disc, and he did the same things over and over and over again. And again, he was another one of those guys where you were never quite sure what you were going to get. Well, he did the Schubert 9 for DG and Chicago with, like, lots of repeats. It is 59 minutes of the dullest music making you've ever heard in your life. It is absolutely atrocious, boring beyond belief. And he remade the Schubert Ninth with fewer repeats, yeah, thank God, with Bavarian Radio for Sony. And it might even be a little bit slower even without the repeats, but wow, what a difference in the playing, the difference in top to bottom sonority, clarity of contrapuntal lines and sculpted bass phrasing and oh, all that good stuff. It's a billion times better than his Chicago recording on DG. It really is. And and both of those were later in his career um, when you, you know, when he, he tended to get rather slow and 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 indulgent in terms of like, you know, tempo and things like that. But but that's a beautiful Schubert Ninth. The second one, and and or at least the Bavarian radio one on Sony, whereas the DG one with Chicago is just like ugh, ugh, horrible, awful, terrible. Next, let's see, what are we up to? Number five here. Bar talk, music for strings, percussion, and celesta. Okay, Carion and the Berlin Phil. Now Carion had a, he had a feel for this work. He recorded it a couple of times. The first time or maybe, I think he did it maybe three times, but the first Berlin one, let's put it that way. There may have been a mono one. I keep forgetting because he did things so many, so many times. It was ridiculous. So there was the the first Berlin one, which was on EMI, and it was just dreadful. Oh, my goodness, it was dreadful. It was just, the sound was bad. The timpani playing was awful. The the it, 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 the, the strings had not been carionized yet which they really needed to be. They sounded really out, uncomfortable and out of place in that music. But then he redid it for DG um, much, much later. I think it was like late 60s or early 70s or something when he had completely possessed, uh, possessed that string section. And wow, oh my goodness, the string playing is just to die for. It's gorgeous, unbelievable and fabulous. And the balances are better and everybody's better enormously better. The sound is better. The whole thing's better. It's just better, 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 better. And that's the point of this entire chat. So the bar talk is like a, a very, very good example that you can make comparisons and, 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 and hear for yourself just what a difference, you know, decades of, you know, whipping that orchestra into shape really did, especially in contemporary music. You know, Carrier didn't do that much, but when he did do it, you know, he really made sure they played it. Yes, he did. You know, like the second Viennese school stuff and all that. And this is one of those instances too. Beethoven again, back to Beethoven. Symphonies numbers four and eight with Bernard Heitink of the London Symphony on the LSO label. One of the best records that Heitink made in his late career. Fabulous performances of Beethoven symphonies four and eight. And I have to say, I mean, th this was his third go round because his first two were just snooze fests. He did Beethoven first with the London Phil because the Kitzirchenbau wouldn't let him do them. They had Jochum to do them because they felt he was too inexperienced. And so he said, nah, well, screw you. I'm going to do them with the London Philharmonic. And so he did. And the Phil, and, and they were right. He was immature. He wasn't ready for it. And he even admitted it later in his career. Well, I wasn't ready for it. Yeah, it's like, yeah, it's like, we told you so. Then he remade his whole Beethoven cycle with the Kitzirchenbau. Um, and it was just dull, also dull. Not as dull as his LPO versions, perhaps, but still pretty boring by any standard. And then, finally, he redid a Beethoven cycle with the London Symphony, um, and it was much better. And why was it better? Well, it was better because he took advantage of the, the latest um, advances in performance technique study and, and interpretation as promulgated by the period instrument people, and that just woke him up. I mean, th this happens many times. One of the, the better aspects of the whole period instrument movement has not been playing things on period instruments and all that. Not at all. It's been giving normal musicians license to re-examine some of their assumptions 
about the way the music is supposed to go and adjust their interpretations accordingly and take a fresh look at the music and perform it in a different way. And for some people, that was a very invigorating experience, as it evidently was for Bernard Heitink. Um, how much of the credit is due to him and how much of it is due to the orchestra and the zeitgeist of the way the music is supposed to go, I'm not prepared to say, but he really did a slam in Beethoven 4 and 8 um, that's insanely better than all of his previous versions. So good for him. Next, oh, we're going to go back to Claudio Abbado. Why the hell not? Verdi's Requiem. The reason I picked Abbado again is because his first recording of the Verdi Requiem, which was supposedly thrown together when another recording project fell through, it was with La Scala Forces, was the worst Verdi Requiem ever. It was soggy and soft and some people called it spiritual. I mean, it's just bullshit. It was just boring and, and, and awful. I mean, my gosh, everybody snoozed through it. Every, it was just dreadful. And so Abbado redid it in Vienna with the Vienna Philharmonic, a much better performance, better playing, better singing, better sound, better everything. Absolutely better. Just plain better, as I keep saying in this video. It's the better video. Um, it's a much better very requiem. Is it still a great one? Is it still one of the best ones? No, nobody's ever thought so. But compared to the disaster that was his first recording, gosh, I remember when the first one came out, we all, yeah, you know, we all got together in the record store back in those days. It was, it was Record Masters in Baltimore because I was in college. And we went to listen to this thing and we were just like, oh my God, what went wrong? Everything, everything went wrong, frankly. So that sucked. But the remake didn't suck as much. So that was the, the less sucky version, which means it's better. Next, Schumann, Symphonies 1 through 4 with David Zinman. Now, originally, he did a decent Schumann cycle, really very respectable for Telarc um, and the Baltimore Symphony. It was quite good. Um, clean, well played, very beautifully recorded. Just a little bit on the ordinary or generic side, I would say. And so he redid them with the Tone Hollow Orchestra of Zurich. Um, for Arti Nova, and that's one of the great Schumann cycles in modern times. Whoa, boy, what a difference that turned out to be with, with clarified textures and bracing tempos. It's just beautiful, absolutely beautiful, and, and much, much better than his first versions, which were good. I mean, there wasn't anything particularly wrong with them, but there's a difference between just being good and just being fabulous, and this remake was fabulous, amazing. The same thing is true with Nielsen Symphony's cycles, Nielsen 1 through 6 with Herbert Blomstedt. Now, Blomstedt's first Nielsen cycle was with like the Danish National Symphony Orchestra or something like that, one of those Danish groups. Um, it was on EMI. And it was, it was just, it just was, it was average. Really average. It sounded average. What does average sound like? Well, it just wasn't terribly exciting. Um, it wasn't particularly well played. It was... Say it was sensible shoes, Nielsen. You know what I mean? It just, it, it got the job done at a time when there weren't many Nielsen cycles out there in stereo particularly. Um, and so it was, everyone had it. We all had to have it. You know, it was almost a reference recording, one of those mediocre ones, you know, that was later replaced by something much better because then when he got to San Francisco, he did a whole new Nielsen cycle and it was just fabulous. And gorgeous sound, wonderfully well played, far more lively and rhythmic and, and, and propulsive and, and impactful than his first versions. Uh, and you know, like the difference is just there for everybody to hear. You can, you can tell instantly how much better the remakes were. And most people agree with that too because it became one of the, the iconic standout Nielsen cycles, one of your go-to versions. And last but not least, this one always always got me because it was just finally, I was like, oh, uh, when was it going to happen? It was Mahler's fifth with Leonard Bernstein. Now, Bernstein's first Mahler five was uh, with the New York Philharmonic, and it just didn't go well. He, he, either he hadn't quite internalized the music the way he should have, or and the orchestra didn't play well. I mean, the timpanist gets lost in the scherzo, and I, there, there are just things that go wrong, and the sound was really grotty. It just was a a bad day for everybody. I mean, the, the, you know, Bernstein's identification with Mahler was such that it's not a disaster. You know, I mean, in terms of the way Mahler Five usually goes with most people anyway, it still was better than quite a few, but it was not up to his standard, not at 
all. And so thank God when he did the remake with the Vienna Philharmonic, this was on tour, and I think it was recorded in Frankfurt on tour, in a good hall. It's one of the best sounding of all of his Vienna Phil recordings. And he just nails it. I mean, finally, you know, it's, it's, it's a broader performance like most of his late recordings were, but still totally idiomatic and wonderfully played. And, and everybody does what they're supposed to do. And oh my goodness, it's such an improvement over that grotty sounding, scruffily played first version from New York. And so there you have it, my friends, 10, 10 conductors in this case, who markedly improved on their original versions when they did their remakes. It does happen, and it happens fairly frequently. You can never tell. As I've always said, every recording has to be listened to for its own merits, and you have to take them all as they come, which is what we're doing. So keep on listening, friends. Thanks for joining me. Take care.